Someone's phone. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. You're you're famous, man. Come on, people are calling. <laughs> and you're you're you have a like a garden situation out there. Go ahead, go ahead. We're we're cool. We're we're always here. Yeah. That's what I love when you wear that Hello Kitty shirt. It is my favorite. Well, I, you know, I have a, it's a Yo Kitty shirt. Oh, yes. And I have one in, in, because we, when the, the child goes to bed, we sit around and make t shirts. <laughs> I love that. So it says Yo Kitty, actually. Yo That's Kitty. Amazing. And I have one in, in, uh, yeah, I have, I can, I can get you, I can hook you up. All right. That's because, good. you know. Thank you. Yeah, Yo Kitty. Because I think, you know, Hello Kitty. Because, and you know that Hello Kitty is not a cat. Did you read about that? I did not read about that. Yeah. Hello Kitty is not a cat. Hello Kitty is a little girl. I'm going to have to look this up. That's so fascinating. Just, just so you know. I mean, I wouldn't want you to be like out of the loop. Thank and anyone else is watching now that we're having this public <laughs> private. Thank private. you for Hello Cute. Kitty is not a cat. Hello Kitty is a little girl. Yeah, and so it gets it gets interesting. You go down the Hello Kitty rabbit hole, but fortunately, I think t t Tim Blake Nelson's going to save us from that. I think he is. He, but he's he's on he's he's on the phone. We can. I'm I'm good. You good? Yeah. You good? Are, are you good? Sorry about it's, that. It's, all, it's okay. Where are you? Where are you today, Tim? There was an issue because my phone is hooked up to my computer, and oh. so even when I silence it, it oh. rings all over the place. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm in Manhattan. That's a terrace. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking behind me. Maybe a terrace will manifest. <laughs> if there's a hand of God there, so maybe all good things will come. Oh, very today, good. Yeah, today we're we're thrilled that you're here, and I love that you have your guitar in the background. I think we should have um, we should have we should both like play the guitar during Watch Me Work. We've got Tim Blake oh, Nelson. We've got Tim Blake Nelson, everybody, hanging out with us during Watch Me Work today. Tim Blake Nelson is an actor, a playwright, a filmmaker. His filmography, I love that word, as an actor, spans 80 feature films. 80. That's a lot, man. I mean, he's made films with these incredible people like Steven Spielberg, Ang Lee, Terrence Malick, who's amazing, the Coen brothers, who are phenomenal. He's worked, also, he's worked off Broadway at the public at Manhattan Theater Club, Playwrights Horizons, Manhattan Class Company, uh, New York Theater Workshop, Soho Rep, as a playwright, because he's also a playwright and a very fine playwright. Um, he's written The Gray Zone, The Eye of God, and Socrates, which I saw, uh, was it last year? Did we share the green room together? We did, Socrates. when you were doing White Noise, yeah. And we're hanging out. Uh, for TV and film, he, his directing credits, because he's also a director, uh, include The Gray Zone, Eye of God, Leaves of Grass and Z, among many other things. Tim, we're so glad that you're here today. It's my um, pleasure to be in your this, this is so. This is so cool, man, because um, what we're going to do is we're going to all work together for 20 minutes, and then we're going to come back from that work session. Um, and, it, and everybody, just so we know, we can do any kind of work. It doesn't have to be writing or, you know, it can be choreography or painting or whatever you want. We'll work together for 20 minutes, and we'll come back. We'll talk with Tim Blake Nelson for a little bit about his work, what he's up to today, and then he will take your questions about your work and your creative process. So I have my timer. Um, and uh, you don't need one because I got one and Audrey's backing me up. So, and, oh, oh, yeah, you're right. But Audrey's going to tell you how to get in touch. I'm so sorry. I would never leave you hanging. <laughs> so, you. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, so if you do have a question, you're inside of the Zoom. As a reminder, you can ask a question by clicking the raise your hand button likely in a participant tab at the bottom of your screen on a laptop or the top if you're on a tablet or an iPad. Um, and I'll call on you sort of in like um, whatever order I feel like. I'm sorry. Um, and then um, uh, then uh, if you're watching on HowlRound.tv, you can also tweet at, at us at, at WatchMeWorkSLP with the hashtag HowlRound, H-O-W-L-R-O-U-N-D. Or you can tweet at us at, at Public Theater NY or message us in Instagram. And we sometimes take questions from there as well. That's it. Right on, right on, right on, right on. Okay, we're going to work for 20 minutes. Here we go. Boom.
wherever we were <laughs> we were in we were in wonderland okay so uh we're back we have again we have a very special very awesome very talented guest um and very wonderful person tim blake nelson who's here today to talk about uh he will take your question but first before he takes your questions about your work and your creative process i would love to hear a little bit from tim about what I mean, if you if it's comfortable to talk about what you're working on right now, you've got so many cool projects. Uh, yeah. I'm working on a long prose piece. Ooh. Um, here's a draft of it. Wow. And, and I know we don't measure things in inches, but that's impressive. I've always wanted to try my hand at one of these and and uh, so I've been doing it for about the last year and change. Um, and frankly, it's because I've written, I, I have too many film scripts right now that haven't, that are waiting to get made, that, I haven't, that I'm not, I haven't made yet. And I didn't want to write another but I always want to be writing. And so I just thought, why not try uh, prose um, in my 50s? <laughs> and so that's what I've been working on. Fantastic. That's really, really cool. I mean, it's very brave. I, I think it's very brave when an artist who is known and respected and loved and revered in other forms decides to try something. It sounds like you're trying something new. I mean, writing even that is not new, but Prose. You mean fiction? Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Like a novel? Yeah. Can I use those words? Okay. Right. So, and this, this, would you say this is your first novel? Yeah. Yeah. So that you get the like the badge of of, of honor and bravery, because well, yeah. I tell you, um, I don't. Even though it was very uh, perhaps obnoxious of me to hold the the thing up, I I don't. I don't. Um, I don't know that I'll ever get it published. Uh, I probably could, um, but for the wrong reasons. Mm. Um, but I wanted to just see if I could do it. Mm -hmm. And so it's just been as much of a, uh, as much a calisthenic exercise mm -hmm. as it has been an attempt to, to make something that I could share with people. Mm -hmm. um, I really don't know what I'll do with it. Uh, um, there are a lot of inhibiting factors, but the main one is I don't want to put something out there in, in a form that is so sacred to me because I'm always reading a novel mm -hmm. uh, and I revere novelists. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to put something out there that that I don't feel merits being in book form for, for people to read. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, I don't want to get a book published just because I was on Watchmen. Um, I want it to be on its own merit. I understand. I understand. Um, and if so, how would you know? I mean, these aren't the questions I'm supposed to be asking you, but how, how would you know that it is good enough then? Well, I think probably everybody on this call and I'm looking, there are 90 people. Um, and if people are serious enough to sit at their computers and write for 20 minutes uninterrupted and it probably went by like that for everyone. Um, I'm sure every single person identifies we're our own harshest critics. Mm -hmm. And usually that's to a fault. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that that where we get in our way most of all is um, through demeaning ourselves and 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 considering ourselves uh, uh, somehow fraudulent, not up to snuff, out of ideas, all the stuff we say to ourselves that inhibits the process, mm -hmm. um, and that's all hateful and destructive. And I try to keep it at bay, mm -hmm. but I do let it in the room 
when I'm reading full drafts of my material. And I'm very, I'm just hard on myself. Um, and so I have the, I suppose, um, aesthetic hubris to feel that I'll know if it's, if it's worth sharing. And there are sections of this which that are, and there are sections simply that aren't. It's an odd process uh, when you have that much space because a novel can be as long as you want and descriptions can be as long as you want, particularly as long as you're not showing it to anyone. Um, I guess that's true about a play too. Uh, and so you can, but, but, but there's less inhibiting a novel because you're writing for people who just love to read. And yes, when you write a play, you're writing for people who love to go to the theater, but they don't love to go to the theater and sit there for more than three hours. Um, I, you know, I love David Foster Wallace. I love Tolstoy. I love, um, you know, Murakami, you know, a lot of these maximalist writers who, who don't let the scope of something inhibit their work. Uh, but I look at my novel and I get, I, I, I feel that at times it just becomes unruly and I get out of control. Um, and it takes uh, a good deal of um, disciplining rigor and self-criticism. And that's just been a great process for me. And so even if I never share this with anyone, it'll make my plays better and my screenplays better. Do you have the same um, process? I mean, because you work in, in so many different media in so many different ways, you know, an actor, a writer, on the stage, on the screen, um, a director also. Do you have, do you feel like you employ the same um, tools when you, when you work, you know, the sort of, you're not, you, you let the, that voice in the room at the right time. Do you think you do that from, from project to project? Uh, I'm a form is content guy. I'm of that school. So even though I'm a, a, a studied classical, um, you know, classics in college, uh -huh. where form and content are just meant to be distinct of one another, I have a much more modernist uh, or postmodern view of, of form and content. Mm -hmm. So I think that when you're writing a play, you have to indulge in the plainness of it. And when you're mm -hmm. writing a novel, it has to be resolutely a novel. Um, that's part of its content. The form is the content and the content is the form. They're, 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 they're one when you're doing it right. And the same is true with being an actor as opposed to being a writer. So if I'm gonna be in a Susan Laurie Parks play, I leave the playwright at the, I don't bring the playwright into the room because that's not helpful to anyone. It's not, it's, it's not my play. And if I'm thinking like a playwright, then I'm not doing my job as an actor because I'm, out of the give and take that I need to have with my scene partners. And I'm suddenly thinking in a, in a differently critical way. Critical is a good word. Um, uh, about the, as a, as, a, as a creative collaborator. Um, and so when I have a question as a, as a just as an example, uh, of a playwright, it's never about the writing of the, it's about what do you want out of me? How does, this is not working for me. How, what am I not getting here? Or um, perhaps because as a playwright, I really appreciate this from actors. Sometimes when an actor says I'm not getting there, it's because I haven't, there's something more I can do as a playwright. Um, but I try to leave the playwright at the door when I'm acting and I leave the, it's funny, I don't leave the actor at the door when I'm writing uh, because I love writing for actors. Um, and, and often I find myself writing parts 
that I would love to play but never could. Um, women, for instance. Uh, and, um, but, you know, uh, uh, or older people or younger people or people with a different sensibility than I, you know. Um, writing Socrates, it, only Michael Stuhlbarg could have played that role. Uh, but it was delightful for me to be able to give him that and almost in a very constructive way li to live vicariously through um, just even imagining before he, we went into rehearsals uh, what he was going to do with it. Do you have a preference? Uh, people ask me all the time, I don't know, do you have a preference? Which, uh, you know, do you prefer film to stage or stage to film or are there so, there's so well, many I'm things. I'm not like a rock and roller like you. <laughs> what do you mean rock and roller? I see you, you got your guitar back. To, what is that? Is that a, a guitar? Yeah, it's two guitars. But I just oh, learned yeah. to play guitar to do Buster Scruggs. Uh, which, which we love. Yeah. <laughs> you, you're kidding. I had no idea. You were looking like you were really playing on that movie. Well, I learned. I studied, oh, oh. It for, <laughs> I studied it for six months, hours a day. I have a wow. son. My wow. old son, Henry. Yeah, is a really, really, really serious guitar player. Oh, right at on. Oberlin Conservatory. Oh, and right. he does classical and jazz guitar, and he's a okay. composer. Anyway, yeah. he taught me uh, to play, and I practiced the guitar. That's like, actually this is the, uh, and I didn't stage it here. It just happens to live in my office. But this is the Buster Scruggs guitar. Oh, that is fantastic! Ha! <laughs> oh, that's so cool. And then this, this, this is a uh, oh nice a guitar that um, is from the '40s. It's a catalog parlor guitar. Oh nice! I got in Jackson, Mississippi, in the Fondren. Very nice. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Parlor guitars are coming back in. Well, I'm a little guy. It's the only guitar I, you know, I can't play a dreadnought. Well, uh, yeah, they're too, they're too big. It's like yeah. it's like playing a boat or something. Um. So anyway, no, I don't, I don't have, uh, I don't, uh, I don't have a preference. Mm -hmm. I, um, I just, uh, I don't know. I wanna, I, I, I can't go through the day without working on something. Huh. And I think a lot of what I do comes out of um, uh, a restlessness. Um, mm. And there's a lot of restlessness you have as an actor um, because you have time between parts. Um, and even when you're playing a part, you have a lot of time. And um, I've written plays. I wrote The Gray Zone, uh, the play I had up a long time ago at Manhattan Class Company, um, uh, backstage doing a Peter Parnell play at um, wow. Playwrights Horizons. Wow. Um, wow. But I think, you know, you're, you're <laughs> that sort. Um, yeah. And I'm sure a lot of the people on this uh, phone call are, um, mm -hmm. on this Zoom mm -hmm. call are. Mm -hmm. uh, I think but I like what you talk about the rest, the restlessness, I think, and you lean into it instead of it being like, I, I feel restless and agitated. So I'll pick up my phone or search the internet, you know, or read the news uh, or whatever you're, restless to be working on something that's that's very beautiful tim yeah i i i'm that 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 is uh I, you know not to get too deeply into it but i uh was um almost in a a, uh, a in a what was that movie clockwork orange way uh um taught to despise myself for any even hint of lassitude uh so um uh, and that's a blessing and a curse. Um, but I just, you know, I, I just need to be doing it. Um, mm -hmm. or I just don't much like myself. Mm -hmm. hmm. That's interesting. That's, that is a deep rabbit hole. Um, we're going so, to, um, but we're going to see soon. <laughs> now smiles on my face and we can move on from that. No, but, yeah. you know, again, I doubt, I doubt I'm the only one on this call who, who is motivated in that way. And, and you need to make it your friend, not your enemy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a feeling of lost, you know, I don't, there's a feel, sometimes I feel lost, like, 
if I'm not doing something, I don't really know who I am, which is another rabbit hole. But I have a question, another question about your work, <laughs> your creative process. So do you prefer writing plays to films or teleplays? I mean, do you have a, you know, or is it all, for me, it's all delicious writing, but what about, what about you? What do you think? Um, I think, I dare say that just for the writing process, probably film is my mm -hmm. least favorite mm -hmm. because, you know, screenplays are made to be, written to be made mm -hmm. into movies. Mm -hmm. They're like architectural plans. Uh, and they really pale in comparison to the house itself. And other forms of writing, I've never really written a teleplay. Um, so I don't know much about that. Um, but I can tell you that's, I, it's probably the same with the teleplay, but film even more so. Because with a movie you're writing, you know, you're writing this, this, you know, films are events to me. Uh, and you're writing the blueprint for that. So it is like the blueprint versus the house itself. Whereas plays, um, at least the ones that, I write, and my God, certainly the ones you write, uh, are also so much about the words um, that that the the form of a play is somehow less um, distant from the form of a of a of a theatrical event. It's it's there's less of a distance there. It's not blueprints or design of a house and the house itself, I don't quite know what it would be. It's not even a maquette versus a statue. It's, 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 I, 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 I'd have to think that through because I'm spinning it right now. Um, but I do know that at least with the plays that I write, the words and the rhythms are, are really important. And the distance between what's on the page and the performed event uh, is um, far uh, narrower than the one between a screenplay and a movie. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And with this new experience writing prose, it's, it's you know, it, 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 is, it is the book. The form mm -hmm. of it is the, you know, the, it, it is the, the bookness is the book. Mm -hmm. um, and that makes the writing quite challenging mm -hmm. and, 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 but also, it, it, you know, when it's working quite delightful, but it's a marathon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I guess I like prose and playwriting, mm -hmm. the writing process more than writing a movie. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're restless to get on set. And then when you're on set, you're restless to get into the editing room. And then, I mean, it's crazy when you're in the editing room, you're restless to get into get timing and post-production sound. And out. <laughs> yeah, and then you're heartbroken because it's done. Right, right, right. Hmm. And once you're done, no matter who you are, I've really never met an exception to this. It's always underwhelming hmm. in retrospect. Hmm. Um, because you know the the schedule on a movie mm. is so inflected and controlled by how expensive it is to make them mm -hmm. that eventually you're always um, you know having it's like in that Guerre play Six Degrees mm -hmm. you know the, the 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 picture is always being taken away from you mm -hmm. before you feel like you're done you could work mm -hmm. on them forever mm -hmm. you love Terrence Malick I mean mm -hmm. Terry. Yeah. Terry is a great example of that. You know, mm -hmm. his best movies, he spent two years editing both of them. Wow. I, in my opinion, the first two. Wow, yeah, 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 yeah. Wow, two years, okay. In the edit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the edit, right, wow. This is, oh, I'm so happy that you're here today. So you feel like you're in the mood to take some questions from our, hey, you guys our, our people? Yeah, yeah, so we have, we have about 15 minutes or so. Uh, yeah. Let's take some, Audrey, call on some people. All right, Carla, you are up first. 
Go for Hi it. Hi there. Hi. Uh. Hi. 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 I'm Carla. I actually uh, work for an apostle of the public theater during uh, Socrates, and okay. I saw it about six times. Oh, you did? <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, but it was great. It was great because as ushers, we get to sit in a different angle, so we get to see the play in a different way every time and with a different audience every night, so it's really cool. Um, so my question is, I I'm, I'm I have multiple projects in writing. Some of them are novels. Some of them is more playwriting. Um, but my issue is, and you mentioned this earlier, that the form is the context, and it's just sometimes I see things more as a novel because I find too many details or too many things come up, ideas, or I find myself, I guess, lost in the research of things. Like for example, I'm writing something where I'm describing a city, and I get lost into the history of the city and it's, it's a medieval city and there's all these gates and why are these gates here and instead of focusing on the characters I find myself going that way and then I'm writing something where I'm finding myself in the detail as a novel but then I I wrote uh this one is based on a memory and I wrote it as a play and sort of imagining the audience being with me in my memory and so I just I guess my question is how do you know when which I wrote it down. How do you know which form the content will take, I guess? Like when you have an idea or something. I suppose it's a give and take, but the give and take starts with a gut feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know, the memory play is an entire genre. Um, uh, we don't talk about them anymore, but geez, in the 50s, it was a whole thing. Um, yeah. And there are some beautiful ones. Uh, and so you obviously had a, you know, you had a gut connection to that tradition. Um, yeah. And, and I think it's really useful to hear that. But the give and take then comes in saying, all right, I've made this decision and I'm going to indulge that. And mm -hmm. I'm going to make this as live theatrical as possible. I'm going to make it indelibly that. I, I okay. had an interesting process on, you know, the play, my play, The Gray Zone, uh, I then made into a film. I did not direct the, the play. This wonderful director named Doug Hughes did. And his approach to the direction of it uh, was to, it's a Holocaust play and it actually takes place in um, the crematorium, number one crematorium at wow. Auschwitz. And so he said, well, we're never going to have all that on the stage. You really can't. So I'm going to pare it all away in terms of the set and really rely on side light uh, and um, sound. And okay. so and so it was an environmental production in terms of light and sound. Mm -hmm. And he took the theater, which was the old small theater at Manhattan Class Company before they moved to their fancy current environs. Mm -hmm. And he clad it all in cement and it was incredible. It was a really great production, but it had no detail in the set design. Mm -hmm. When I made the film, I, made it hyper real with the wonderful production designer that I had uh, named um, Maria Jerkovich. And she just, she was, a, she's a fantastic production designer. And, and she really, you know, with her collaborating with her, we really went to town in terms of every detail. And so in the movie, if you see the movie, you see every detail of the cremation process. It's, it's wow. lit. Yeah. Um, and there's the sound, but it's also lit natural. There's, there's, it's, not, it's not lit theatrical, it's natural, natural light. So in one, you have something that's indelibly a live theatrical experience mm -hmm. that leans on light and sound um, and exploits the audience's imagination in theater to fill in the rest of it because theatrical audiences are very imaginative in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas in the movie, you expect to see everything. You can't conceptualize like that unless you're doing something like Dogville, the Lars von Trier movie, and that's the point. 
But that wasn't the point of this movie. It needed to be absolutely real. And so it, ha it, it could only be a movie. Hmm. Yeah. So the give and take is once you make the decision, really embrace the, um, the, the, the nature uh, and the signifiers, whatever, however you want to put it, of your form. Okay. Yeah, but yeah. That you, also... Susan's, you see one of Susan's plays, you couldn't do it as a movie. It's just, they're mm -hmm. theater. They're absolutely theater. It's its own, it, 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 she like practically invented a, a genre because it's so yeah. theatrical. And, you know, that's, that's, that's what you have to do once you make that decision. And then finally, and then I'll shut up. <laughs> make your own, you know, who's to say that in a play, it can't suddenly go into a monologue that's eight pages that is hmm. borrowed from, um, you know, uh, the novelistic form. And then you're inventing something new and that's your own approach to theater. Yeah, that also makes me think because sometimes I have trouble with third person and first person. Sometimes if I'm writing the novel, I'm trying to write a third person and all of a sudden I keep writing and I'm like, oh wait, all of that was in first person <laughs> because it just came out naturally to me. So it, well, it helps. I yeah. mean, you know, in, yeah. in the play I was talking about earlier, Six Degrees of Separation, you have dialogue, yeah. dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. There's no act break in that play. And then yeah. suddenly, bam, about two thirds of the way through, this character walks out center stage and just talks to the audience and tells an experience. And it's so That's powerful. Great. And it's first person. So there you go. Yeah, all right. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Tim. All right, up next, we've got Judy. Judy, are you with us? Hi, thank you. Um, my question is, how often would you interrupt a writing project because another opportunity comes along and so you start chasing down a new writing project to, to meet that opportunity? Uh, you know, I most of my projects are self-generated. I've done a few jobs for hire. Um, and but usually with me, it's more I'm writing something and then I get an acting job. Uh, but um, it's kind of like um, water, you know, and cracks in a sidewalk with me. It's path of least resistance. Uh, so I ended up writing a, a prose piece because, uh, you know, the, the air traffic control for the airport you know, my projects just said, we don't have enough runway space for you to land these movie scripts you keep writing that aren't getting produced. Um, and so don't send another plane to our airport. And so I thought, all right, I can't, I can't, <laughs> I can't do that. There's no, I can't, there's no landing space. It's clogged there. And so now's the time I'm gonna try to write a prose piece while at the same time I'm getting those other movies set up. I will make those movies. I just, you know, I was doing Watchmen, uh, which took half a year. And before that I was, you know, I did a bunch of acting roles. Um, and so I just had, to, you know, these scripts that weren't getting made. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I think, It's not often healthy to let yourself get interrupted when you're in full swing, but it's great to be interrupted when you can get some distance from something that you, that's driving you nuts. Is that helpful at all? I feel like I answered your question in a way that's specific to my life, but maybe not as, maybe not, not be so helpful for you. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's helpful. I mean, I, I, I look at, I have several plays I'm working on and they're all different stages and I'm okay with that. I have so many more ideas, but then all of a sudden I hear this opportunity has a deadline of June 30th if I want to write for it. And then I think, no, 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 because it takes me a long time, but then it doesn't leave me. I start writing it overnight in bed until I, I, I approach it. And so I guess I'm looking at how common is that among writers 
um, I look at everything I write will help with something else I'm working on. Well, the, you know, there are all types of fishermen and some fishermen need to use one pole and concentrate on that and just hold that line and feel when the fish is going to bite. And some like to put eight lines out and you got to decide who you are. I'm more of a one pole guy, but that might not be who you are. Okay. Thanks. Very good. <laughs> Thanks, Judy. Um, all right. Uh, we've got about four minutes left and we've got time for, I think, one or two more questions. Let's see. I'll try to be shorter. Take your time. Do what you want to do. All right. Taja, go for it. Hi. Hi. Um, my question is about when you know a project is done. I mean, I feel like that's, I don't know, even know if that can be answered, but I'm curious as to what your process is because I feel like I can never let mine go. Are you a playwright? Yes. So do you have people come over to your living room or do you go to somebody's living room and have your stuff read and listen to it? Yes, yeah, sometimes. I'm also in school, so we have like a, a process that we can do that through the school, which I do. Yeah, um, I don't know. Uh, I don't, I haven't, I've, I've written, I've rewritten in every single time I've been produced. And it's not, it's not, uh, I don't know, I've been produced as a playwright maybe five times. So it's not some huge amount. Um, and uh, I've been, I've always rewritten all the way up through the last preview until I, until somebody says, all right, enough. So Socrates is an example. I was making changes literally until Doug Hughes, the director said, your script is frozen. And then when I published it, I made more changes. Do you do that, Susan? I do, it, it depends. Um, uh, yes and no. I sort of also just leave things alone and go on to the next thing. I, um, you know, I mean, but, but Socrates is different. You were actually working on it, it was, you know, a, a, a big play and you work on it until the director says stop, you know, which is great. And then you fix it some more, do a little more tweaking when it's published. I think that's normal. I think that's a good way to work. Um, but in answer to your question, the student, uh, Tasha, um, and maybe Susan would want to chime in here. Uh, you'll learn to hear your, to, you'll learn. I don't think when I was a student, I had much of an idea when I was done. In fact, usually when I was a student, um, I was convinced I was done and I wasn't even close to done. That's helpful. Thank you. All right, we're gonna take one last question um, and we're gonna to go to Erin. Erin, go for it. Hi. Um, Hi. I feel like I'm speaking or to giants, so I don't even, <laughs> but um, um, I guess my question is I'm working on a screenplay and I know the beginning and I know the ending very clearly, but I feel like the ending is predictable. And I'm wondering like if you've come across that or, or what you think about predictable endings. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, and you might not be able to know whether your ending is predictable if you don't have your middle yet, which you, you don't. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't think, I don't think predictable is, you know, 98% of the time predictable is a pejorative when it comes to narrative and maybe 2% of the time you want that. Uh, my youngest boy was just writing an essay about Twelfth Night uh, for ninth grade English. And he sort of made the point, this is ridiculous. You got these people who barely know each other marrying at the end. It's all sewn up. I don't buy it. The rest of the play was so much more interesting uh, until these, these, these marriages at the end just puts everything up in this predictable bow. 
And I thought that was a really interesting point. Um, uh, and that pops into my head. I would just give yourself a break. You know, with a lot of these, with writing, I still feel like, and Susan, please say it, tell, tell, tell if this is bad advice. Um, uh, you know, I think of it in, 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 a certain res, in certain respects as abstract painting. And you just want to get your, your fields of color and your, your basically your abstract, the bones of your abstract up on the canvas and have something to work on rather than all these uh, demons that you can allow, sorry for the word, but that you can allow to, like the one you're bringing up right now, to tell you, oh, it's bad, it's no good, it's not worth it, it's a problem. All that's gonna do is inhibit you from getting the paint up on the canvas. Right now, on a first draft, who the fuck cares if your ending is predictable? It doesn't matter. You can change the ending. Rule one as a writer, you don't have to show anything to anybody until you want to. And so write whatever the hell you want. Just get it, get your pages out, get it moving, get credible, interesting action that has traction and grit and truth. Uh, and, you know, paint on the canvas and then worry about that's predictable because you can always go back and change that and set it on its head. What do you think about that, Susan? Is that helpful? Oh, my, oh music to my ears, brother. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I think you're exactly right. You get, get it down, then make it better, you know? And, and I, I, I agree, predictable. Predictable is, you know, is in some circles, the meat and potatoes of Hollywood. So don't worry, don't sweat it. You know, giving people, giving the people what they expect is, is okay. It's not a crime. <laughs> All right, it's six o'clock. Well, it's six o two actually. Tim, you're such a blessing. What oh, a blessing my. to have you! Yay, we give you virtual hugs. Thank you for coming here. Oh, uh, breath of fresh air and and so so inspiring. Um, and it it's great to hear what you're working on. It was my absolute pleasure, and and just to everyone who's writing out there, stick with it. That's 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 what it's all about. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Come thank back anytime and, and talk with us some more. Share with us some more because I'd love really... to. And thanks for hosting this. Oh sure. All right. Thank you. Thank you. A reminder, Bye, everyone. Everybody. Bye. Our our links will be posted for next week, starting tomorrow at three p.m. And we'll see you next week. We will not be here on Monday because it's Memorial Day. Okay. Bye. Have a happy Bye. Memorial Day, everybody. Bye. Happy weekend. Thanks, SLP. Thank you.